Well, hello, everybody, um, and welcome to this joint GDI and Asia Society Switzerland webcast. Um, I hope you are all doing well uh, from wherever you are dialing in today. Uh, my name is Nico Lufsinger, and I'm the co-executive director of Asia Society Switzerland, coming to you from Zurich today. Um, so a few words about Asia Society as we start. We have only been active in Switzerland uh, for about five years, but globally, we have a long and rich history. Founded in 1956 by John D. Rockefeller III, there are now 14 Asia Society centers around the world. Our goal globally and also here in Switzerland is to increase understanding of Asia and Asian issues and foster dialogue and exchange. We're very, very grateful um, to be able to partner with such a prestigious organization as the Gottlieb Dutwaller Institute, the GDI, today. And I want to thank David Bossart, uh, Laura De Wolf, and the entire team uh, for the very great collaboration. Before we start um, today's conversation, I do want to take a moment um, and talk about two upcoming events from both organizations. Um, and let me share my screen for that with you. Um, next week um, at Asia Society Switzerland, we are hosting an online uh, mini conference, is what we're calling it, um, which is focused on the future of agriculture and food production in Asia. And then from September to 10 and 11, a little ways off, is uh, GDI's 70th um, edition of their flagship international retail summit, um, which is a fantastic two day conference bringing together decision makers and leaders from all across the retail industry and definitely something uh, that you don't want to miss if you're if you're in that space. Um, so those are two upcoming events. Um, you can scan the QR codes that you see on your screen and that will take you directly to the registration pages. Um, but of course, they're also listed on the respective websites. Um, and with that, let's get started right away and launch into today's conversation. I've always very much liked the quote, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, and it probably very perfectly applies to the world of retail where one market, of course, China, has just developed tremendously and, and incredibly quickly over the last years. Um, the e-commerce penetration in China is estimated to be 36%. Um, and that was notably before the pandemic hit and shut down uh, several large Chinese cities for weeks or at times even months. So what can we learn from China's e-commerce landscape? Um, what are the trends that we see there that we'll eventually you know, see in Europe and Switzerland in other parts of the world um, as well. Is China the laboratory of the future when it comes to retail? Um, I could not think of two better people to discuss this with than our guests today, Duncan Clark um, and David Bossart. Um, Duncan is the chairman of BDA China, a company he founded all the way back in 1994. BDA is advising clients on the consumption and technology markets in China and other Asian countries. Duncan is also the author of The House That Jack Ma Built, a uh, really wonderful and excellent book um, on the history of Alibaba and its founder, Jack Ma, um, which if you haven't read, you totally should. It's very insightful, um, gives a lot of context on that, on that fascinating uh, person and, and, and company. Um, he's also a global board member of the Asia Society, and he joins us today uh, coming from uh, his apartment in Paris. Hi, Duncan. Hi, good morning. Good afternoon, almost. <laughs> um, and of course, David Bossart is the CEO of the Gottlieb Duttweiler Institute, um, the beautiful building that you see in his background. It's a totally real image, and he's really actually standing in the front lawn uh, there. Um, and of course, his work at the GDA, GDA uh, focuses, among many other things, on the future of consumption, uh, digitization, and societal transformation. Welcome, David. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is we'll first uh, hear a few introductory remarks from Duncan um, on the e-commerce landscape in China, and then we'll have David sort of respond to that and give some context on um, how this is relevant to Switzerland. So with that, um, I'm very happy now to hand over the words uh, to Duncan Clark in Paris, who will start us off with a quick outlook of the wonderful and sometimes crazy world that is Chinese e-commerce. Please, Duncan. Thanks very much, uh, Nico, for that. And thanks to everybody uh, for your time today. Hope you can enjoy your lunch during this and we don't have to look at each other eating lunch, which is good. <laughs> um, so I'm standing here in Paris on the left bank, uh, not far from where actually some of the first uh, shopping malls uh, in the world effectively were uh, built, the galleries, which were heated. Um, if you uh, come to Paris, you can see the origins of the offline retail world that we sort of came to know and perhaps now we are seeing more uh, in China, a glimpse of where we're heading in terms of the online world sort of eating everything up. Uh, we've seen that of course, uh, in the last few months uh, as we responded uh, differently in different countries to the crisis. Um, so maybe a quick uh, introduction. I hope you can see the slides here as I tab through. 
Right, so just a quick scene setter. Um, I mean, China is already the largest uh, by far uh, e-commerce market in the world, uh, three plus times more than the United States. Um, and we'll talk about the reasons for that. Um, but obviously in terms of, uh, partly that's driven by the sheer population, but also the penetration of e-commerce within that. Uh, there are other countries ahead of the US also, we can talk about uh, in Europe, a number of countries ahead of the US, uh, like UK, for example, in uh, e-commerce penetration, but the mass size of the, of the Chinese market. Um, and somebody's saying, we, can we get the presentation slides? Yes, Rainer, you can. This is the benefits of live. <laughs> so we will send those to you. So um, in terms of the COVID impact, obviously it's still, you know, every, everybody's still trying to assess the impact uh, on their own lives, on their own countries and economies. Um, you know, Daniel Zhang, the chairman and CEO of Alibaba, of course, Jack Ma is no longer in that role. He recently made some, I think, pretty obvious, uh, but, but good comments that um, we now see more people shopping online, of course, than before, even in China, where they were already shopping a lot. But we saw increasingly more categories um, where people would previously resist shopping. Uh, and of course, groceries in particular. I mean, of course, if you know, your life's uh, at risk from going out, you're certainly, you know, and we must thank the, the frontline workers who've delivered this. But the, you know, the amazing logistics that came in, even in places like, like Wuhan in China, we saw how robust uh, you know, uh, the system was and how reliant people were on this, literally reliant for their lives in some cases and livelihoods. So, I mean, we've seen massive increase in grocery deliveries. I think uh, 60% uh, of the fresh hippo chain, which is a sort of new format of, of Huma, uh, Alibaba's sort of uh, online, offline kind of uh, grocery, 60% coming now from online, which is up a lot. But we've seen a massive increase, 100% um, growth in the first quarter, of course, on, on online uh, purchases through that. So basically, on the other hand, retailers who may previously have thought that you know, online was, was perhaps a luxury or some experiment, it, it's, it's a necessity. And of course, tragically, we're seeing a lot of pure offline um, retailers disappear, particularly in markets or in countries where there are, is not support for them uh, from government, etc. So obviously, we all know this uh, around the world, but even in China, where e-commerce was already very well established, it's even more so. So this shift to digital has, of course, been uh, and, and contactless digital has been reaffirmed even here in Paris. I mean, the habit before of, you know, meeting the delivery person in the, in the lift. Now, of course, the lift is simply a, almost like a dumbwaiter where one's food or <laughs> deliveries are presented uh, and then you, you retrieve it. So no human contact. Uh, you know, we're just at the beginning of uh, thinking the possibilities uh, of, of where we are, but the new normal is very different from, from the previous mm -hmm. situation. So in terms of the, um, just, I've talked about this before and I was happy to give a talk early on at Asia Society in Zurich. Uh, it hasn't really changed, but you know, this is what we're talking about right now. I mean, what Jack Ma described as the iron triangle, this applies to all e-commerce really. You have you know, the three sides of this triangle, uh, the, you know, the choice of products and the e-commerce uh, side. So the range we just talked about, the growing number of categories of products available online. In the case of Alibaba, that's uh, essentially Tmall and Taobao. They have overseas uh, investments, and we can talk about the Southeast Asia connection, for example. But basically, things that you buy is on one level. Uh, how they get delivered, we just talked about the logistics side of things. And finance, how do you pay for these things? Um, I was in China until the 28th of January, so already experiencing some of the lockdown in Beijing. And for about a week, uh, you know, driving around, for example, the reliance on online payment to pay in parking, you know, places, things like that. Uh, we could see already that we could feel the benefits. The cash already was disappearing in China very fast. And now we feel that same here uh, in Europe and elsewhere. So contactless payment limits have been raised everywhere. You know, there we, definitely we're seeing the impact. So these three in, in concert, you know, this is the stress test that we went through really with COVID. And I think uh, it, you know, it works. You know, uh, obviously there's some, um, some aspects that need to improve, but this is, is, this is almost a, a pivot for the Chinese economy as well, away from export-led growth to increasingly domestic-led. And that's even more so now, you know, because China's export markets have, have collapsed, much as they did in 2008, where we saw, the, you know, an earlier um, validation, if you will, of, of Alibaba's business and these other businesses. So um, moving swiftly on, then we're going to get quickly to... To David and some of the Q&A. So obviously the famous sort of singles day event, I was there in Hangzhou in November. It seems like crazy to be in a room of so many people now. <laughs> you know, $38 billion of sales generated in 24 hours. 
Actually, I don't want to just talk about Alibaba. On the 18th of June, it's actually JD.com arrival to Alibaba has its traditional uh, sort of consumption holiday. So that's coming up next week. Of course, now Alibaba has also launched its 618 uh, promotions as well as uh, Pinduoduo and other Chinese companies. But basically, there are these sort of red letter days, if you will, in the calendar. 1111 being the most famous because it sort of was made to be the singles day, 1111 phenomenon. Um, but just look at the numbers there. I mean, 1.3 billion individual deliveries. You know, this is sort of pre-COVID. So in a sense, that was almost a stress test for getting, you know, the delivery system up uh, to a level that had, hadn't been uh, imagined. Uh, and some of the, you know, the statistics per second that might be coming in, um, I think at peak we saw 544,000 orders per second. <laughs> so the infrastructure to support this, uh, both on the payments logistics side, is, is phenomenal. Um, if we go to, you know, what does this mean for, for example, Swiss companies and, and Western companies? There was a big push at this last 1111 to promote this sort of global shopping mall, if you will. So these cones that you can see uh, here, if we click on the video, we'll see a little bit. These were, you know, sources of items that were being sold into China. Uh, and you can see on the top, on the left, that Japan actually was the number one source of, of goods then. Uh, we see Germany represented in the top five there. So you can just feel the energy of that. I mean, the, you know, video shows in some places the, where all these products are going basically as well. So we go back here, we can see, obviously China is markets. It's not one market. And look at this, the white, the white element on the right hand side, the coastal and, and sort of more prosperous area is 90% of the market really, if not more. So, you know, getting from wherever in the world, we see other cones here in Southeast Asia and Japan, I mentioned New Zealand. This is the, you know, this has been the logic for engagement with China. Of course, that's been increasingly questioned by some, but the reality is this emerging consumer base online wanting to buy, uh, you know, better products. Um, and, and of course, th there is an economic impact in China of COVID. We'd already talked about a slowing economy in, in China before that. And there is a talk of a consumption downgrade that some people may not buy as many products, uh, you know, luxury goods, for example. Cosmetics was hit by COVID because when you wear a mask, you know, <laughs> certainly part of your face doesn't need uh, makeup. So, you know, there is uh, questions about how far this can go, but we still feel in China the you know urbanization drive continues uh, and the aspiration to better one's lives, um, even though with more head headwinds now. So this remains the story. You know how can how can Western so penetrate this market? Um, so Alibaba is not the only one here. Uh, of course, I mentioned JD.com, Jindong, uh, which is a sort of a it's traditional bitter rival, if you will, for Alibaba. And we can talk about the benefits and you know, cons of each of these companies, but it's known very much for uh, higher tier cities. So in China, we talk about tier one, two, three, four, and you know, rural basically. Uh, and the higher tier cities uh, like Beijing, you know, JD is I mean, this is the company I would use pretty much every day for, uh, for basics, but also for things like major appliances as well. I should say that my shirt is from Taobao. So I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, lawyer, a, a loyal Taobao user as well. <laughs> Um, and Pinduoduo we'll talk about as a, as a kind of scrappy company that's grown at a massive rate, particularly in those rural areas and using more social commerce um, to, to sort of uh, challenge these two. I'll leave you these slides, as I mentioned, but, you know, the gross merchandise volume of Alibaba in the last 12 months up until March was one trillion dollars, um, which is really one sixth of all retail sales in China. So in terms of e-commerce, it's, it's you know, well over two thirds of the market. Um, but in terms of all of sales in China, it's, it's, it's a sixth. So that's a phenomenal number. We can talk about big tech and what does that mean? But active users, you can see even in the first quarter, which was the key quarter for COVID for China, they increased their active users by 15 million. Um, and, you know, here are the market cap numbers for these companies. Alibaba, a very profitable company at $20 billion. JD, you can see is, you know, making money, but not that much. Um, but has a you know, substantial uh, user base um, and actually is now just announced it's going to be launching an IPO in Hong Kong. You can see that Alibaba is both on the New York Stock Exchange and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. We're going to see shortly um, uh, JD joining them and Pinduoduo uh, losing a lot of money, basically, um, but having a very large number of users uh, surpassing JD. 
I'm going to quickly go through because I, I want to get to the discussion. I just wanted to point to one trend that we saw that I saw there, which had been emerging for some time back in Hangzhou. But this concept of live streaming, and you can see on the left side, there's a you know a bunch of looks like instant noodles or something. On the right, just stacks of slippers and random stuff. It's a messy. It's almost the size of an apartment. But in this apartment, this woman that we'll see featured, Viva Huang, sold 425 million dollars worth of of goods in 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 that period. Um, she was, uh, she was telling us that she had so little time to even go to the bathroom that, you know, she was worried that she wouldn't get through the day. Um, but you can see here. So it's basically, you know, it's, it's scrappy, you can see, but, you know, holding up much as you would in the street market in Zurich on a Sunday, whatever, it's bringing that into, into people's uh, living rooms. Um, this idea of zhubo, uh, jianshang, so, you know, streaming e-commerce. Um, and others are entering into this market, of course, because we have other streaming companies, famously Kuaishou and even more famously, uh, what you know is TikTok, Douyin, um, you know, um, looking in the case of Kuaishou partnering with JD, Douyin looking to uh, leverage this massive user base. Uh, and then we have others, not necessarily always in streaming, but Meituan, which is another player, which is very strong in logistics and food delivery, but is now moving into consumer electronics deliveries. Um, and many other, and cosmetics. So, you know, it's a, it's a scrappy uh, dynamic market. Um, and COVID has, if anything, kind of energized these companies and the investors behind them even more to see how far they can push it. So that's, that's my initial opening. Thank you very much, uh, Duncan. Um, I think, you know, just in these very few uh, minutes and, and your remarks, there's already a lot to unpack. And of course, the question we're most interested in today is, how is this relevant to us here in Switzerland, to us here in Europe? I'm just going to turn it right over to, to David with the question from, you know, all that you've seen in, in Duncan's presentation. Of course, you, you also watch, watch, watch these spaces closely um, as, a, as, a, as a part of your work. How would you assess the relevance of what we're seeing happening in China in the e-commerce and retail space? Uh, for the Swiss and European markets? What, what are the things we should be prepared for to arrive here soon? Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks, Nico, and thanks, uh, Duncan. Uh, I think there are a lot of convergences right now happening, but on the other side, we see a lot of highly different uh, points we still that will still prevail. First of all, I think we have five Ds. That will be a huge issue in governments, in savings for consumers, also for companies. Then the second D might be deflation that lasts over the next two or three years, which might have a huge impact also. Then we see, until not now yet, deglobalization, which was just the case before we saw uh, the happening of COVID-19. No one knows what the rearrangement of all the supply chains means for uh, Europe, for the US, and for China, and for Asia. We see much more digitization. Of course, there is uh, China as far as advanced, and we will see the impact of demographics. But the biggest advantage, of course, for China is you can build retail structures from scratch, whereas we in Europe, and also in the Western world, we have to destroy strongly established retail chains and retail structures. So China can easily leapfrog go over just certain phases we had uh, passed through over the last decades. And I think the big difference is we have a strong, wealthy middle class that is already 50 plus. Whereas in China, you have a strong, very young middle class that can at least for the next one or two decades spend a lot of money. This is a huge difference what we see in Europe. But basically it is about e-commerce platforms that are going to dominate more and more, the big ones that can scale and can uh, reap out the network effects. The second one is about the search results you can reap out. Then what Duncan mentioned where we are not very, very far is live streaming and social. We have Instagram and all these medias now very prominently. You have put that together in a few apps in, in China. And of course, regarding the payment system, I think also uh, China is ahead. When we look at Europe, when you look at the United States, uh, we see that when we look to non-food, um, we suppose that over the next five or six years, the non-food that goes online on e-commerce will be 50-50 to what is being sold in stores. But also don't forget, generally speaking, non-food sales are generally slowly but continuously declining. Why? 
because we have the demographic effect and the demographic impact, all the people, they need healthcare, they need other things and consultation, not products anymore. And um, of course, we see much more live streaming, much more, um, much more entertainment services. In food, you interestingly see that probably we are going through COVID up to 10% of sales in food online, but more and more we see also meals, full meals are being catered, especially also to the elder generation. Interestingly, we see much more new channels popping up. You see now street vendors coming, street food is coming, people who put their, their chairs outside the restaurant because now the government is, is, is more just generous in, in giving you the, the chance to cater to people in the fresh air. But generally speaking, the consumer is the winner. Much more choices than ever. But you might say, I always love to say that in three very simple but precise words, the consumer is first of all king, more choice than ever, more price comparison than ever, easy availability in real time, so king. But on the other side, the consumer is also a dictator. Why? He can comment on products, he can comment on social media about the product he doesn't like, about uh, ratings and rankings they put on a product she doesn't want and she or she dislikes. So she's also a dictator. But we as consumers are becoming more slaves because we are becoming more transparent. All they, those who track our data know much more so they can predict what we are going to buy next. So we're being tracked, we're being nudged more and more. This, I think, will not go away, but the key point for me is we must understand when we talk about consumers, we are now all users, not just consumers. And the user is much more driven by algorithms, it's driven by apps, it's driven by upgrades, software updates. So the point of the consumer is much more the service component and the entertainment component and less as the consumer was about the product component. And the key for the consumer is to control the entire experience in the e-commerce and in the whole live streaming world. So empowering the consumer is, I think, what Alibaba does very well. And this is the difference certainly also to what we have here in, in, in Europe. But generally also we can say we are moving from the old retail model in Europe and in the US where we said, we are putting products on stage. So the theater was basically the framing of the retail experience. But today we must say we are moving to much more a cinema approach. 3D cinema is now with live streaming coming more and more. So uh, it's interesting to see that also the expectations of consumers are much higher when you're in a cinema and you have the control over the experience and you can influence your experience. And when you see the last opening of a very huge mall in, uh, in, uh, in Jersey, in, in New York, uh, it is called the American Dream Mall, but basically it's not a mall because more space is dedicated now to entertainment, meaning you can ski, you can down race a hill with skis, there is Nintendo, so the entertainment space is much larger than the retail and the restaurant space. So also offline you see an evolution towards the role model of online. So online is giving the role model. I think that's, that's also very interesting. Duncan, uh, I think, correctly mentions just the framing of what is the size of these companies. When you, for example, look at the market cap, Alibaba was mentioned, Tencent was mentioned, you can include infrastructure suppliers like uh, Huawei, for example, very important, the cloud business, don't underestimate that. When you look at the business model of the big guys like Amazon, they are also in the cloud business. And also taking into consideration that is very important. So if you look at, for example, the actual market cap of Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon, it equals the German GDP. It equals the German GDP. Just imagine how important these companies became. So the question certainly is, um, will these big providers get bigger and bigger or not? A Chinese investor once told me the big skyscrapers are already built. So what we see is probably companies that are 20 stories high, but no longer 100 stories high. 
So the question is, will these big guys get bigger and bigger and bigger, or do they reach the limits? And what does that mean? So we have the big Chinese players, and we have the big US players over the next years. What, what, but I don't know who framed the comparison best between Amazon and Alibaba, the two dominant players. What is Amazon? Amazon is basically fast transaction and, and, uh, and um, efficient, but it just works. People who buy on Amazon spend on average eight minutes on Amazon. Compare that to Alibaba. What is Alibaba? Alibaba is Amazon plus Disney. So the big difference is Amazon is also, is, is just transactional, very calm, cold, but Alibaba is cool in terms of entertainment aspect. It brings you fun, which we saw perfectly in the examples that Duncan mentions to us. So not an accident, people spend about 30 minutes on Alibaba and not just eight minutes compared to Amazon. Um, we can, I could com continue on that uh, in the length, but I will probably stop here. On the level of business models, basically we have a platform approach. And the platform is basically someone who facilitates and brings together a buyer and a seller. Whereas on the other side, you have a very peculiar model like Apple. Why is Apple so strong? 1.2 trillion market cap, because this is an aggregator. An aggregator intermediates and controls the relationship between a buyer and the seller. And this is why the app system in the app stores from, from uh, its app store from Apple is so strong. So they control the whole environment. And you have a lot of these big guys that are control freaks. And Apple is a very good example for a total control freak. Um, interestingly, I think we see that all these are basically not financed by e-commerce, but by cloud by payment systems, by streaming. And so it is not an accident. Pure players in e-commerce, I think, are not the future, neither wherever you go. And uh, the, I think this, this, this we have to take into consideration. I think we should uh, discuss later also about the impact of live stream, but I'm stopping right now here. Thank you very much, uh, David. And again, I think there's a lot there to unpack. Uh, we've already getting a lot of questions from the audience and we'll, we'll, we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. Um, I'm glad, Duncan, that we've already cleared up the issue of what your t-shirt says. Yeah, so I'll take it off this, third. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Large, a very bad temper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let, let's see if we can ask you questions that will bring that out um, over the next 30 minutes. Um, so I, I wanted to, before we turn to audience questions, come back to a few things that, that both of you have said. And uh, Duncan, I do love this you know, analogy of the iron triangle, I think that demonstrates very clearly that getting all these products online and you know, ready to be ordered is just one small part and, and, and there's much more. You mentioned this incredibly mind-blowing number of 1.3 billion deliveries. Um, I'm assuming that's just Alibaba. Just in that within one. A single, within a single state. So this is just for reference, um, there's 1.4 billion inhabitants in China. So it's almost one delivery per person, um, which I, I just kind of like struggle to comprehend how that's even possible. So on that note, and, and specifically with logistics, um, I have this image in my head of, you know, sort of e-commerce delivery, food delivery, service deliveries in China being done by this army of you know, fairly underpaid people on their bikes or on their rollers. Um, and you know, they, they, um, uh, they cruise through the cities to deliver coffee and whatnot. To which extent is sort of the, the even, to which extent is the possibility in China of doing all that delivery predicated on there being a lot of cheap labor available? Which is something oh, okay. that we might wanna, we might wanna, we might expect to change as China becomes more wealthy. So is that, an important factor and do you think that will change at a certain point and will make delivery actually harder? So that's, a, that's an excellent question um, and you know um, a friend of mine Tiff Roberts or Dexter Roberts has a new book out um, I'll send you the link but basically on this massive you know several hundred million you know rural workers who had been working in the, in the cities obviously in the coast particularly in factories some of those have become the delivery uh, people also construction workers who you 
people who used to be construction workers have moved more to delivery or driving DD cars, you know, so this absorption of excess labor, you're right, it is, uh, the D is a challenge for China too with demographics. China is the most rapidly aging country in the world. Uh, I also live part-time in Tokyo, which is the uh, aged country <laughs> where we see, you know, th there and Korea much more embrace of robotics. But China will also, and China is investing, you know, controversially even buying robotics companies, as we know, with, uh, in Germany and so on for manufacturing. But also I think we will see, and we already see, actually, I have a video I could pull up later when I checked into a hotel in Shenzhen last year, the Marriott. Um, I went up in the lift with a robot, um, you know, and the, the most amazing thing was that nobody around me seemed to pay this robot any attention. Uh, I followed the robot up to, from, from the sky lobby up to a room and realized it was delivering uh, food. Um, so um, this is already happening in China. It's, it's both a excess, you know, labor still in some of this uh, countryside labor uh, pool, which is massive and, and in need of, of, of jobs, but also this tendency to try everything. Like in China, I think there's no resistance to technology. If anything, it's sometimes technology doesn't make any sense. You know, you go to the Great Wall, you will see, you know, you have to use a QR code machine, which is manned by three people. I mean, <laughs> so it's both, you know, it's not either or. It's, it's kind of a, we can do this, you know, and let's try this. And that's both on the supply side and on the demand side. Like people are very keen even, and it's not just a youth thing. It's elderly people who want to, you know, do the coolest stuff and, and use technology in new ways. It's, it's cultural, I must say. I, I hate to sort of generalize, but in this case, we don't see this phobia, tech phobia. Uh, and obviously there's associated discussions of privacy and, and all that. But generally we see, and it's not just China, there's a more of a, within Northeast Asia, certainly, um, and Southeast Asia, I feel, and South Asia, we do feel a more predisposition to trying technology. But the demographics will affect uh, how this comes. Whether we see robots Soon, there, there are trials right now, um, but China, don't forget, is a very densely populated, particularly the coastal area, very different from, say, the United States, where it was very difficult to distribute on the same scale. Yeah, um, and, and I think you're making a very important point there also with sort of this, uh, this, this, um, this happiness of, of, of generally China to, to use technologies with a strong entrepreneurial spirit. It kind of reminds me of, I think there's, 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 a, there's a part in your book where Jack Ma and his wife visit Switzerland and there oh, yeah. is and it's Sunday and all the shops are closed. And uh, I, I'm not sure if this is apocryphal or not, but the Czech mom's wife sort of turns, I'm not sure to you or to somebody there's like- My friend Abir, who used to work yeah. out, but she lives in Geneva. It's a true yeah. story. <laughs> um, and, and she says, she says, oh, are all the shops closed because everybody who works there is at their second jobs. Yeah. And that's why they can work. And I thought that it was sort of, there was such a, there was such a great sort of line of just kind of like this not understanding that part um, um, of culture. If, if we want to stick to logistics for a little bit, because I think that, you know, sort of is, is maybe not the, the not so glamorous, but super important part of e-commerce. David, um, if, if you look specifically at the Swiss market or, you know, the markets in, in, in like Switzerland and surrounding countries, where are we in terms of logistics, you know, and what has maybe the lockdown where we've also seen like dramatic increases in, in e-commerce activity shown us on where Swiss companies and, and sort of the Swiss e-commerce sector needs to invest in terms of logistics. How ready are we to deliver? I guess, you know, the comparison would be around 7 million deliveries in one day. Like how far away from the yeah. single day Alibaba goal are we? Yeah, basically we are a small country. We are 8.5 million people. So compare that to uh, any kind of big city in, 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 in China. And you see, we, we simply can afford, for example, the last mile. So we depend on, uh, on larger providers, we depend on massive uh, scaling and network reaping out network effect, effects. So, for any kind of Swiss player who wants to do delivery, it's very tough to to to, uh, to to make a profit. But what we see, of course, it's coming also because we have to. And uh, as mentioned already, the demographics will play a very important important role, I think, for the elder generation, especially. And um, we see in many cities that we are not prepared because we don't have the system of logistics. I uh, think Paris, think Rome, think uh, the old uh, uh, part of uh, Zurich. It's nearly impossible to drive through with a truck. But you also, when you have the role model of New York, uh, it completely changed. New York with uh, much more deliveries, 1.1 million package delivery a day, uh, 35.7 million additional trucks entering, uh, entering New York, and about uh, over half a million fines 
for trucks that walk the roads. So they gave an additional $27 million for the police the income, um, which, which, is, which is probably the better side of all this. But we are not prepared. We don't know where to put the lockers. There's no model right now. We don't have the warehouses. At what time of the day or the night should we provide? Should we bring it? And in highly dense, densely populated city urban areas in most European cities with well-established structures in the U in a huge difference to China, we simply can't do that business-wise and do that profitably right now. So we have to figure out, probably when we think no longer in terms of streets and in rails, but also in drones, drone taxis and so on, waterways, then we have the 3D, 3D world, not the 2D world. Then we can just give relief to additional ways of just catering with cars and uh, with rails. But we see a lot of new means of transportation. So we see, if, say, for example, up to two kilometers, you can walk or run when you have meal delivery. Up to, let's say, five, seven, you have an electric vehicle. And for the longer distance, which is a little bit crazy. You should also have an electric vehicle, of course, but then you have the gas-driven car. So it is about looking at what means of transportation we use and how we can best do it to just look at the logistics in cities with all towns and all parts. Thank you. Um, let's turn to, we, we have received so many questions already from the audience, so I, I do want to start um, answering at least some of them. And, and please, if you haven't submitted your question yet, do so. Um, if you want to take a look at the list of questions and, and upvote some of them to give us a little bit of a signal of, of what is of most interest, we appreciate that. Let's just start right at the top with a deceptively short and simple question, which I think it has probably an enormously complex and complicated answers. And the question is, what is the future of food sales? Um, and maybe we can turn to Duncan first and, and, and then have David comment on it. So Duncan, if we look at the Chinese market, what are some of the trends that you're seeing specifically in delivering food, delivering groceries? Do you, for example, see a trend towards also bringing in, um, that was another question from, from the audience, is there a trend of bringing in smaller vendors, even, you know, like producers to sell directly to consumers by means of online platforms. So we kind of like the farm to table movement. Is that something that we see happening in Chinese retail already? Yeah, no, I mean, China, you know, young, urban, sophisticated Chinese consumers are increasingly demanding better foods, particularly things also like, uh, you know, baby formula, of course, of their parents, um, but also for themselves, there is a growing, you know, just look at the number of gyms in, in China now versus five, 10 years ago. And that'll even, well, they're closed right now, probably, but the, uh, the health uh, and fitness sort of revolution is sweeping uh, China too, obviously, you know, getting off tobacco, but also eating healthier. But we also see that a lot of young people don't know how to cook um, because it is, you know, if you go on to um, some of the Chinese apps like Ulama, which is the Alibaba one, or we talked about Meituan, Dianping, I mean, the range of products available um, from every province of China, every you know, country and within, you know, stunningly within you know, 10 minutes, even your, you know, if you wanted to have your, your KFC or your McDonald's, you can have it sometimes within six minutes. So it's, 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 it's almost like they're, they're cooking it outside your house. We don't know how they do it. So um, it is this just in time, instant delivery culture, um, which by the way, has had impacts on environmental aspects, a lot of packaging and, and, and these, these companies are trying to uh, mitigate that now, but it is a concern. But yeah, so I think for food already, uh, both the, the prepared meals, um, meal kits to some degree, I think has been a bit more recent, but also um, the, I mentioned this uh, uh, fresh hippo supermarket, the Hema, which Alibaba pioneered. So it basically, it's, a, it's almost like a distribution center that serves, I think it's a two kilometer radius of that place. You can go there and buy your products in the normal way. Um, you can also pick up fresh, you know, shrimps and, and lobster, which is a kind of a lost leader for them. Um, but it gets people in that sort of uh, that mindset of being a traditional market. But you can uh, just as easily have the stuff delivered from there or or buy it there and have it delivered for you. Even we're going back to the 19th century in some ways. They have these sort of risers in the shop where if you wanted at a certain point, you could just hang your shopping bag. And I have a I have a Migro one here as an example. Uh, there's no promotion here, but you could hang this. It would go up and then it would be distributed for you. So you would literally see it like much as the old days of pneumatic tubes, you know, and and uh, these kind of trains above you sort of stuff uh, feeling. You see that in these. So this this is the mix. And this is the category that initially people were questioning. So what's the point? But the point is 
putting these centers strategically in urban areas, you start to really dominate because you know that within 30 minutes, this is the key, you can have the product that you want, you know, fresh milk as well, in frozen goods. Um, so this is the O2O, the online to offline, offline to online blending, blurring that is happening. Um, and so China has been very much pioneering that. And don't forget, what, long before Amazon bought Whole Foods, this was already the trend in, in China. So China, again, is sort of setting trends in, in this area. And uh, David, maybe if we can just look, compare this to the situation here in, here in Switzerland, it seems that yeah. um, e-commerce for, for groceries, fresh food has, has long been a little bit of a challenge because people are reluctant to do it. Briefly, do you see that changing either as a result, like a very direct result of the pandemic and the lockdown and, and where, where people just felt it was more, more convenient or, or of course other trends? Are we moving more into the direction of where China and, and some other countries as well are going or is Switzerland still not convinced that our food should be delivered? Well, well, we clearly saw, Anik, over the COVID phase that more and more people are going now online for the first time. And when you see it's convenient, it's easy, it's like with sound scanning in the store. First you think, oh no, what the hell, that's nothing for me. But when you start to use it and you understand the convenience factor, then you get ready to do it over and over again. And if it works, it becomes a regular, a regular behavior. But I think overall in Europe and also in Switzerland, it clearly over the next five to seven years, it's alternative proteins, especially for the younger urban generation. Um, it is less meat, of course, generally speaking, uh, very important because we have to take care of, of climate change. We have to take care of CO2 emission. We have to take care of energy use. We have to take care of water use. We have to take care of what is the space we need? But we see also interestingly that there is a romance factor coming back, meaning that urban places that are the most advanced all over Europe, they're becoming greener and greener and greener. I think you're going to see the same all over Asia. You see it already in Singapore. You see it in Japan, in the big cities. I think the same is coming more and more also in China, reintegrating the best from the rural area into the, the, the city, the core of the city, meaning also on the high tech side, you're going to see professionally managed urban farming, vertical farming, hydroponic panic, uh, products um, that can be now profitably done because you have the, the resources and you lose, use less space. We had last week a webinar about the future of food and we discussed that and one of the results was that up to 10% of food provision, basically it is green leaves, it is salads, easy products that don't use, use a lot of energy and water can basically be sold in the city now. But on the other side, you have the romance part, part not only the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the high tech part. When you see how many people here in Europe, take Berlin, take also Switzerland, are applying for an allotment, their private garden, because you live in the city, you have only a small balcony, but you want an allotment where you grow your vegetable, also flowers, but mainly vegetables right now. It makes you reconnect. And what we clearly see with COVID, there is the rewilding trend, meaning people want to reconnect with the forest is becoming something mystic again. Like in Germany, the German forest is something very mystical. Wood is very mystical. So you want to reconnect with this past because you think in your mind, this can help you to, uh, to solve all your urban uh, yeah. pollution problems and so on. And, and maybe, if, if I may, I think you're making a very interesting point there, David. I just want to, uh, before we move on to other, to other topics, I want to very briefly play this back because my assumption, Duncan, would be that sort of this romanticization of, you know, produce like sort of agriculture and, and, and rural life and producing food for yourselves is probably completely absent in China. No, no, actually, no, I would say the opposite. Actually, you would think that, but because people have had a lot of uh, issues with food safety, you know, don't forget there've been, you know, cooking oil or infant formula that was killing people. And there's, there's been a growing awareness actually of the importance of this stuff. We have a lot of pollution in China, obviously, of the, of the soil, of the water. So there's, there's a lot of awareness of this. And actually, I, just to, you know, I, I agree very much with what David was saying. Maybe we can coin a phrase here if it hasn't been, but H commerce, you know, human commerce is really what we, you know, E, who, who cares about E, you know, but H, this is where we're moving towards. And the, the platforms in China are very good actually at 
keeping a, a sense of uh, connection to the vendor. So if you're buying from a local restaurant, but also if you're buying on Taobao or other platforms, you know, you have a direct connection with them. They'll chat with you uh, and say, oh, how, how's it going? You know, and, and they'll even tell you about the product. In the case of uh, William Ding, who's the founder of NetEase, which is a, a very big uh, games company, he, um, I think eight years ago, started an a or organic pig business. And you could literally follow <laughs> your pig, uh, you know, the webcam. And, you know, because there's the number one uh, rarest thing in China is trust. And anything that can redress that, where you can actually trust, I can see it, I can, I can feel it, I know the person. So recreating that experience that we, we love, certainly here in Europe, of the, the corner shop and you know, the traditional business, but with the efficiency of, of online, with all the logistics and the speed, that's the, the magic mix if you can get that right. And, and we're seeing that a bit actually yeah. after COVID in Europe as well. Yeah. And, and let me just because again, like I think you're, you're making there somewhat, you know, sort of one of these very, very important crucial points kind of like in, in one sentence is that there's a huge lack of trust issue in, in Chinese society and that of course expands to commerce and retail. So just briefly, what are some of the strategies that these large companies in China seem to have employed to create trust online? It's a huge undertaking, right? You don't know whom you're buying from. Right. You can't see and touch and feel the product, but yet they've been able to very, very quickly scale. So how did these companies, um, how did Alibaba, for example, solve the issue of trust online? Well, the customer isn't king. It's like emperor. I mean, basically anything like if this T-shirt came with a spelling mistake, not that I would recognize immediately, I could immediately criticize that merchant and rate, rank, rate them down. I would within nanoseconds get a message from the merchant saying, please, please restore my, my good ranking. And, and by the way, I sent you a thousand T-shirts to make up for it. I mean, I exaggerate, but the level of power that people have uh, with the merchant, but also on the payment side, um, you know, Alipay started because it was escrow. Basically, you, you wouldn't have your account deducted until the uh, goods arrive. Uh, and so this level of, you know, honestly, I've, I'm much more hesitant buying on, say, Amazon or certainly eBay, where I had a total experience in the U.S. than on China. I mean, in China, you feel very assured that your interests are protected um, yeah. because, you know, these companies, the only thing they can they depend on, and Jack Ma talks about this a lot, is, you know, the customer first, you know, um, uh, employees uh, second, third, shareholders third, because that's how it works. You have to keep them on, on side. Yeah. Um, let's try to answer a few more questions. Um, time is already uh, getting short, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can. So there's a question here um, sort of asking about different approaches between Alibaba, um, who uses a more sort of integrated approach to, to online, to offline, and, and across all its properties. And then Tencent, uh, which is more sort of alliance-focused, uh, leverages obviously WeChat, uh, the WeChat platform that it owns um, sort of as a storefront. Briefly, do you see where do you see advantages and disadvantages of these two respective strategies? Or would you even agree with sort of the notion of these being two distinct strategies? Yeah, Tencent's a very different company from Alibaba. Don't forget, it's cash cow, it's gaming. Every day, it's the largest gaming company in the world. And, you know, you may not be the dem demographic that plays it, but it's just a cash cow. I mean, it's minting billions in every month. And so a lot of that money can help <clears throat> support uh, WeChat being an ad-free or very ad-light platform. So WeChat is the social, uh, mobile social application that is not just messaging, it's, it's everything. It's, it's, you know, community, it's, it's, it's payments. Um, but so they're able to then partner with companies in which they invest, like, like JD or Paisho. So Tencent is more of a sort of a stand back federal approach, whereas Alibaba is integrated, heavily involved. Um, but both are valid, as we've seen. I mean, they're both very large companies amongst the world's largest internet companies. Very different culture. Tencent is very much an engineering led culture. And Alibaba is very much, uh, it's a sales company, uh, you know, from Zhejiang province, the home of entrepreneurs, really. So uh, both, both valid in their own rights, and they sometimes co-invest, they compete. It's a, it's a fascinating competition. And now we see the arrival, I mentioned, of ByteDance with TikTok and others coming up. It's, it's a pretty dynamic uh, market, even though they're very large companies. Yeah. Um, there's a question here, which I'm, I'm not quite sure actually what to make of it, but Duncan, you marked, you marked that you would like to answer it, so I'm going to ask it. Um, because it asks about whether the Swiss Post has partnered with Chinese sellers to improve delivery and simplify the last mile. So this is because, of course, also these Chinese marketplaces aren't selling just in China. They're selling globally, including uh, more and more to Switzerland. Um, are there any, any, any insights, uh, Duncan or David, in terms of uh, maybe we can also expand this? Maybe. Maybe. Um, uh, you know, maybe. Sort of is there, do we see integration with these and, and collaboration of like Western, Swiss, European players with these companies at all? Yeah, from my side, I think definitely we will see more cooperation, but uh, we're very cautious because until now, Alibaba was 
in comparison to Amazon, not so successful, but uh, it might take time. When you look, look at the delivery options you have and you look at the delivery systems, uh, they were privileged until now with the taxis, so this might fail, uh, fall out uh, at a certain moment of time. But uh, in order to, 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 to uh, do more globalization, I think we will, we will certainly opt for, for more, more choices. But right now, I don't know over the next two years where deglobalization is going. And as you also correctly mentioned, what is the trust factor? Where is that going? Because we see clearly here in Europe and in Switzerland, Europe is basically squeezed between the giants from China and the giants from the US. So what way should we go? So we, we try to be pragmatic and figure out what does not harm us, what helps us to do better cooperation. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. I think um, I, there's two things we're talking about here. It's goods from the West going into China and platforms like Tmall or JD Mall, like buying from the companies in the West, luxury and other products and logistics around that. The other is the other way around. So that's consumers uh, outside China buying from China. And even in markets like, like Switzerland and France and Spain, you know, frankly, it's the bold white guys are not really the, the target. It's going to be, you know, often it's immigrants who uh, would uh, embrace actually and do embrace companies like AliExpress, which is yes. wherever um, Amazon is weak or is, is not, you know, or it's too overpriced, AliExpress is doing very well. I think the FT or Wall Street Journal had a recent very good story about this. And we've seen a, a benefit, a uh, boost um, during COVID. Obviously, we saw the the questionable practices about selling masks and other stuff, but people, I'll give you one example. When I was installing a TV here in this apartment in Paris, um, the, the, uh, the guy installing the cable said, oh, I know Alibaba, I use AliExpress all the time. In fact, I have a, a six month old baby and I've been buying baby clothes. And he said, what was interesting is when I ordered, they said, you know, it might take six weeks, eight weeks for us to get it to you. So we're gonna give you a size up from the one that you think. <laughs> and, but he was happy that it was half the price, you know, so. So it isn't, it isn't frankly the, um, you know, the established consumers, it's increasing the, the immigrants and it's very strong in markets like Russia, Ukraine, Brazil, um, you know, where the more price sensitivity or, or Amazon is just not so present. So mm -hmm. don't underestimate the power. And this is happening in Southeast Asia with Lazada, which is Alibaba's invested company, but also others. The China, Southeast Asia, China South, let's say, relationship is really giving a challenge to companies like Amazon, who by the way, Amazon benefits greatly from Chinese vendors selling into the US sometimes even selling more dodgy stuff than Amazon, than Alibaba is selling. <laughs> so it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Um, let's briefly also, there are a lot of questions um, sort of to go in this direction. I'll try to kind of like put them all into one. So it seems that one big advantage uh, by and large of Chinese companies is really that through their much more integrated way of working, whether that's horizontal integration or vertical integration, they just have access to a lot more data. So they're able to, they know their customers probably a lot better than you know a company here here in Switzerland would, where there's a separate payment provider and there's a separate sort of logistical company. So you have all that data. How big, uh, Duncan, of an advantage is this? Are we overestimating this, or is this really right. something that gives these companies an edge that, like Swiss companies, would only be able to replicate if they also were able to get their hands on all this data? Yeah, it's actually an open debate. Even some in China say that there's been a delusion of this, you know, big data being this like new oil and so on, you know, um, basically that actually uh, some of the AI discussions we've heard that, you know, that China's going to leapfrog. Actually, you know, if, if it's not properly structured data or if it's used in the wrong way, it can be equally a mess, you know. So, but I think what we do have is these uh, tech companies are so uh, integrated in different areas, as we see with Tencent and Alibaba, particularly payments, you know, logistics, uh, content, as we heard, Disney. So they do have a lot more data at their hands and they are able to uh, use that, but they have to be careful also not to be creepy, you know, uh, as we know, we've all had the experience when we've had a conversation with somebody and suddenly, you know, Facebook or Google is pushing us to something that we just talked about. I mean, <laughs> I think there's a limit to how much you can push this, but, but certainly the number of data scientists and, you know, um, and PhDs in this area, obviously in China is servicing both Chinese companies and Silicon Valley companies. <laughs> so. China definitely believes in, in, in getting the data and how it's going to be used. This is the big question for our future, really, is which system will prevail, both on a democratic level, but on an economic level. Is there, is there that massive dividend that supposedly is there for, for this? We'll see. Yeah. Um, all right, thank you. We have, we have about five minutes left here. So I do want to ask sort of a final, very broad question, which has also been uh, submitted to us by somebody from the audience. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask uh, both of you to take a quick turn um, and, and give, us, give us a short answer 
I mean, I think that would provide, you know, make for a really, really good end uh, to this discussion. Um, so the question very broadly is, what can Swiss e-commerce businesses, and maybe we can expand that to you know, businesses that are, whose, whose, whose e-commerce aspirations are maybe bigger than, than their businesses so far, what are the most important things they can learn from the big players, whether they are Chinese, Alibaba, JD, Meituan, Ping Duodua, um, but also also Amazon. So you know, if you had to boil it down to three, four points at most, David, what would be your your takeaways? Um, and, and we'll have David go first, and then Duncan. What would be the takeaways um, that you would recommend? What can we what can we learn? And perhaps what are things that we shouldn't that we shouldn't learn? What are things that you would actually recommend not uh, not adapting? Well, for me, it's clear. First of all, it is we are much slower moving ahead due to all the restraints we have from the past. Is it good or is it bad? It is as it is. But clearly, we will never ever be with our framing of data the same challenge that we never have the same chances like you have in China. Their privacy is different, their access to data is very different, and where the culture also is very different. Take that into consideration. This is the first point. But because data uh, should have a value, data should be ingrained into asset classes. And as long as we cannot say my health data have that this or that value, and as long as we cannot say my food purchases in terms of data have this or that value, the big guys will always win who do the analytics, always. For sure. The second point for that is uh, we need trust in partnership. I think transactional alone will not be enough. It might be enough when you just buy a little bit. And but, but for partners, I think it's important that you can uh, can build trust, share really your insights, share your data with the suppliers, with your partners, and uh, create re reliable and long lasting uh, long lasting relationships. So I think. The European approach is much more also about relationship and not just transaction. All right, uh, Duncan. Yeah, very briefly, you've I, spent, you've spent I, so much time in Paris now. What uh, you have to comparison? What should European e-commerce businesses learn from the Chinese ones? Well, you know, some of it is like we're all discovering the same things at the same time. For example, the Rangis, which is the big, uh, you know, delivery uh, warehouses outside China, food now are, are directly engaging with consumers because of COVID. Um, and they're, you know, discovering new businesses that previously they just thought of themselves as a wholesaler. So we're seeing the cutting out the middleman. I mean, that's the number one thing to learn from China is how to cut out the middleman uh, and, uh, and be the next middleman. <laughs> because, um, you know, there is this, um, I would just say one thing is that ignorance of China is not advisable. You may not like it. You may not, you may find it confusing, but actually you may find some very interesting lessons from there that, by the way, American companies are looking increasingly at. I mean, Facebook is now looking at, you know, commerce, like finally, you know, are they going to do a good job? Who knows? But they're consciously following the Chinese example. So for European entrepreneurs and European consumers, you know, we should be aware of what's happening in China. Uh, even if you're a company trying to do stuff and you find dodgy, you know, vendors in China, recommend them to your competitors. They'll tie them up for years. You know? So <laughs> there's everything in China. There's dodgy, there's brilliant, there's innovative, there's copy. You know, it, we just cannot be lazy about looking at China. And there are major political challenges and all this. But at the same time, there's big opportunity. I mean, all this capital that used to be going between China and the U.S., you know, what's happening to that? How much can Europe benefit from that? I mean, think about these examples of ways to be smart about dealing with China. Don't be naive, um, but, you know, um, don't be ignorant. And I think you, you, you just wonderfully basically, you know, uh, summarized the mission statement of Asia society there when you said, you know, we, we may not like what's happening in China or, or rest of Asia. We may not understand what's happening in China, the rest of Asia, but we still have to care. So I think that's a great place um, to end this conversation. Uh, David Bosa, Duncan Clark, thank you both so much for being part of this. This was uh, tremendously insightful. Um, thank you, everybody, for having joined us today. I do apologize that we did not get to all of your questions. There were just too many, uh, but there are many great places. We can follow up uh, offline. Maybe we'll, just, we'll do a summary. We'll do a summary. We can, we, we can do a summary. We'll share Duncan's slides as well. There will be a video recording of this conversation also available, uh, both from Asia Society and, and, and GDI. Um, if you are interested in, in further events from both organizations, you will receive an email afterwards uh, with more information and the possibility if you haven't yet to sign up to our respective newsletters uh, so you can stay informed about anything we do. So thank you again very, very much. Um, and for those of you who have uh, signed up for the executive roundtable, um, I'll see you over there for, for some more in-depth discussion. Everybody else, thank you very much for having joined us for this lunch conversation. And I do hope to see you all uh, very soon. And with that, 
goodbye and thanks again. Thank you. Bye.